The other piece, and I think this is important too, as we think about the policies going forward, is to put this project into sort of its, its, its lo longer term sort of uh, perspective. And so I think in order to do that, um, I think you really need to go about, back about 10,000 years. And you know what you do is if you have, uh, when, when people first start living in communities, um, stable communities, there's really only two ways to organize your society. You either do it through raw power or you do it uh, through tradition. And in this example, you know, um, the pharaoh's kind of running the show, okay? And so, you know, in control of the politics, the economics, and all the rest. And so, if, you know, if you're, he's going to pick you to be a baker, and if you're, not, if you're not down with that, you get your hands cut off, right? And, this, and it works, you know, that's a system that works. Um, and, and, but you also have, you know, here's Mark Chagall giving some insights about uh, sort of uh, traditional life in a village. And, and, and here, it works a little differently, not nearly as rough, but you have these roles, these traditional roles and responsibilities kind of handed down from generation to generation. Uh, you make sure there's a baker in each generation because you pass these things on from father to son. Sort of that's how you run traditional societies. And what I was sort of exploring with this book was uh, in the modern era, you have things starting to change pretty dramatically. And we think about the early modern period dating back to about 500 years. And there you get, it's just follow through with the economic example, you have a situation where um, the, the, the market economy is not, I mean, sorry, the economy is not run by fiat or by tradition, but by the market. You have a whole new approach to, to uh, politics. So you have the social contract theorists uh, emerge. You have people exploring a, a democracy and different issues around that. that. And you know, one of the, another development that you may not think of as a sort of a crowning human achievement is, particularly if you've been to the DMV lately, is the advent of bureaucracy. And sort of one of our leading lights of trying to understand bureaucracy is Max Weber. Um, I know I've been working on this project for a long time when he looks very young to me. So I don't know, you know, so I was like, that's, I don't know. But uh, so uh, Baber really is, 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 is opening our eyes to sort of what's sort of dramatic and uh, uh, sort of revolutionary about uh, about uh, uh, bureaucracies in that they are they are uh, sort of rational organizations. They have rules. They're written down. You can read them. It, anybody can apply to to be uh, if you pass an aptitude test. You you uh, you can advance within the organization based on certain sort of rational principles. In fact, the whole entity sort of takes reason and tries to apply that to the issues that it was set up to deal with. Um, and so it's a dramatic event, uh, a development in human history. Now this has a kind of a parallel if you think about the built environment. Um, and you have, again, sort of cities, you have, you have power cities and you have tradition cities and maybe you think about this sort of, it's always fun to go through, like uh, wander your way through some of these quaint little uh, uh, medieval villages and things like that. But really when people are living in those places, like, well, sanitation's not that great, we're, it's congested, it's sort of, there's no air flowing through here. And so you get some modern thinkers like Corbusier saying, look, we can apply reason to the cities, to the built environment as well. And, uh, so we all, um, we all know what a dump Paris is, and Corbusier decided, well, he's going to take a look at that and see if he can't fix it. And so here's Corbu Corbusier's this, uh, a plan for Paris in the 1920s. Here you have the Ile Saint-Louis and the Seine, and here's the Latin Quarter. And the idea was to sort of bulldoze all those crummy old ratty uh, neighborhoods and build something that would be much better, right? Here you have these sort of what he called towers in the park, right? And you have, there's all kinds of light and air, and there's sort of these are really healthy places to live, and there's recreation all around here. He solved the, co the, the congestion problem because he's built up. And there's all kinds of uh, sort of d dramatic improvements in terms of transportation. And this seems to, this is reason applied to the city to make the life more livable. Now, you know um, Weber and Corbusier are haunting the halls of uh, American uh, affordable housing policy in the 1960s because you can see some of what's going on here, right? This is the Pruitt Igo homes in St. Louis, Missouri. Um, these were actually built a little bit before the 60s. This is a little bit out of the sequence, but if you can kind of bear with me for a second. Um, again, you can see the modernist principles here. Towers in the park, right? Plenty of recreational space. Here's a school. Here's a church. Here's a bus. Um, public transportation, plenty of parking, very nice. Um, and what you see in the 1960s is, is, is this, this sort of sense that we can apply reason to the problems and, and fix it. In fact, when you look at the reports, you look at the affordable housing reports, the HUD reports of the later, mid and late 60s, what really strikes you is this confidence. 
people just feel like, look, we're just going to figure it out. You know, we'll sort of get some engineers on that, figure out what the problem is, boom. You know, we'll come up with a, a, a program to fix it. Um, another thing that's remarkable about the 60s is that there's just this soaring rhetoric. So you have this really interesting... Um, Lyndon Johnson sort of has this great line where he says, you know, America has conquered space, brought abundance to the marketplace, and is going to solve the problems of the slum, right? Bam, bam, bam. And what's really cool is that these sort of, you know, these, these people, these weren't empty words. There was real money put towards these, these goals and objectives. And so what you get in the, night, in the late 1960s is a dramatic increase in the HUD budget. Uh, and you see the number of housing of apartments uh, built by HUD increase dramatically, eight to nine fold. Um, there's a burst of activity between 1969 and 1973 where HUD starts building almost half a million apartments a year, a dramatic increase over, over the earlier periods. And many of those homes are decent, nice homes for low-income families, but a lot of them were instant slums. And a lot of them start going bad. This is proved I go about 10 years later. Um, and you can see where some of the problems start to, start to, to generate. You might, maybe you're managing Prudigo and you're saying, okay, well, something's wrong here. I mean, something's wrong with, the, maybe the design's wrong. There's too much indefensible space, as the argument went at one point. Um, there's, there's no eyes on the street, as Jane Jacobs said. Or perhaps there are problems with uh, the way it's being managed or something like that. Well, you contact your regional supervisor in St. Louis who contacts the you know, committee, who sends the note to the management committee in Washington, D.C., and then maybe it gets up to the secretary. By the the time that decision gets made and it comes back down that bureaucracy, this could have been going on for years. Um, so this is a real problem. And you also have, HUD at this time is also making some really big mistakes in terms of resource allocation. So it's not uncommon to have HUD building 10,000 units of apartments in a part of the city that's been abandoned by 10,000 families that left 10,000 inhabitable apartments there. So, so there's all these the, the bureaucracy is just moving too slow. It's not anticipating the problems. It's not correcting fast enough. And I often think of it as just trying to, to, to hunt uh, a, a mouse in your kitchen with an elephant gun. You know, by the time you sort of level the barrel and pull the trigger, you know, you're, pu you're blowing holes in the wall, but that mouse just keeps on, you know, scurrying away. So the, the bureaucracies aren't working. Now, to be fair, bureaucracies aren't working in a lot of other places as well, including the building we're sitting in. Um, during the 1970s, there's a period of stagflation. The, all the brilliant economists in this building can't figure it out and fix it either. And the brilliant sort of bureaucrats who run the U.S. military can't figure out how to win the Vietnam War. And Watergate has put a pall over the executive branch and the, and, and, and the presidency as well. So there are a lot of institutions that are on the run during this time. So I don't want to, I know there's some people from HUD here, so I don't want to think I'm just picking on you. <laughs> but, um, but, but, but what happens is, that increasingly, clear, it's clear that these programs aren't working, which, um, and, and, and I think it's, you know, you know, one of the, this really struck me when I read this line. Christopher Jenks uh, writes this line uh, in the, the, the language of postmodern um, architecture. He says, uh, modernism ended at 3.32 p.m. on July 15, 1972. That's the moment when the prude igo was, was demolished. Um, and, and, and this is really a pivot point, I think, and this is the point I'm trying to make in the book, what, in the book it's, is that not only were these modernist structures dynamited at that time, but the institutions that built them were also dynamited. A year later, there's a moratorium. Um, HUD, HUD uh, is no longer building housing units as it had before in those big numbers. There's a, HUD has one more burst of building in the late 1970s, but by and large, it's out of the housing and urban uh, development business by the early 70s. 